Good morning. I bring you greetings from Manavi, the, the organization I've been a part of for, oh my God, I hate to say it anymore, <laughs> over 30 years. But before I begin on this very, very complex topic of understanding the complexities when battered women use force or violence, I want to thank the people of the First Nation who are here in this room or elsewhere uh, to give us this space and to allow us to be here. Thank you very much, I honor you. So let me start um, on, in, in this whole really controversial topic of battered women's use of force. I want to start with two scenarios. The first scene, a young woman calls a hotline. She's seeking help because the local police have arrested her and charged her with the crime of stalking. This young woman had fallen in love with a fellow graduate student. They have been living together for about six months. Yes, he has been slapping me about from the beginning but I ignored it all because I love him so, she wails. She elaborates through tearful hiccups that he had just moved out because his betrothed is coming to visit him in a week or so. He doesn't want to see or talk to me at all anymore. She can't take no for an answer and keeps calling him and shows up at his and shows up twice at his workplace. Well, now you can imagine the trajectory of this narrative. He calls the police, and his supervisor testifies about her crazy obsession. She's arrested. Her employer sacks her. Her enrollment in the graduate program is suspended, and she is put in de deportation proceedings. Scene two. Is the second one. A beautiful and accomplished woman begins an affair with a handsome man who is going through a bad patch in life. Well, he's not out of a job or nothing catastrophic has befallen him. On the contrary, he is successful in his career. He has a nice home, very good credentials, and a head full of hair. He even has a wonderful wife and a beautiful young daughter. His bad patch is that his wife and daughter are away for the weekend. Finding himself at a loose end, he decides to have a hot affair with this beautiful and accomplished woman. Well, the weekend comes to an end, as weekends do, uh, and so does the affair, at least from his end. But she won't give up. She stalks him telephonically, intimidates him by showing up at odd places, takes his daughter for an unauthorized trip to the amusement park, and boils his daughter's pet rabbit in a stupa. <laughs> when he confronts her, her irate response is, I will not be ignored. By this time, by the way, all of you must have recognized the plot line of the movie, Fatal Attraction. And please don't tell me you haven't seen it. It's before your time. <laughs> I'll be really sad. <laughs> the story climaxes with this murderous psycho siren. And that's the way, by the way, the advertisement ran. Psycho siren is about to stab the male protagonist and is shot to death by, instead by his former lover's wife. As the movie ends, we all feel relief on behalf of the innocent family, including the man for stepping out for a bit of fun. That doesn't look so reprehensible in comparison to the violence that this shrew had unleashed on all of them. And the first story, the first scene that I described, is one of a young South Asian woman who, has, who had called Manavi about uh, few weeks ago. 
Unfortunately, this young woman is not the only one who has been arrested and charged with domestic violence and stalking and harassment or some similar things in our community. We are seeing a very serious increase in South Asian women being arrested and charged with crime of domestic violence, spousal abuse. Now, to give you a little bit of background in the work that I have been doing in this area for a very long time, um, I, I'll kind of locate myself a little bit. I'm originally from India, and I currently live in the United States, in New Jersey. And my journey to understand women's use of violence and force and intimate relationships began quite some time ago in the 1990s. Now, every time I say a date nowadays, I cringe. <laughs> and I was encouraged, actually, by my dearest friend, Dr. Ellen Pence, to do this. And it is to her loving memory that I dedicate today's discussion. Now, before I begin, uh, you know, really getting into the meat of my uh, talk today, I want to apologize for the limitations of my discussion. I will focus mainly on women's use of force and intimate, uh, against intimate partners in heterosexual relationships. I have drawn the borders very deliberately, and because to my shame, I really don't have the knowledge uh, of the issues in same-sex relationships. So I would like you, all of you who have this information, to share it with us. Maybe perhaps by the end of it, we'll have some time to discuss that. I also apologize for the lack of information on C Canada and British Columbia, particularly um, th the social context here. I hope you'll fill up those gaps also. So let me give you a little context of my work that I did in women's use of force against their heterosexual partners. Sometimes in the early 1990s, Ellen talked to me and said that large numbers of women were suddenly being arrested and charged with deep domestic violence. And they were being ordered to batterers intervention programs. These programs, BIPs, as we commonly call them, uh, were designed to educate and re-socialize men who systematically abuse women. If men were hitting women, the logic was that if men were hitting women and they were being sent here and women were hitting men, why shouldn't they be sent to the same BIPs? What's the difference? Aren't they the same? Isn't it exactly the same? Shouldn't they be treated, men and women treat, be treated the same? So the uh, common word that was being used at that time is female batterers. And, and, and I think it's still going on quite a bit. So being the creator of the Duluth uh, Batterers Intervention Program, Ellen and her organization were pushed to provide an answer to this problem. She instinctively understood that there's men's and women's violence is not the same. And uh, when women use violence, there is some fundamental difference from men's use of violence against their intimate partners. But really, um, she, didn't, she and I both, both of us didn't know how to substantiate this issue. Um, and, but we knew that the same intervention could not be effective in both situations. So Ellen asked me to investigate the issues around women's use of violence in intimate uh, relationships, actually against heterosexual partners. For me, this was a non-issue. I remember the long, long arguments I had with Ellen, and I laughed at her mainly, and uh, saying that, oh, it's a white woman's issue. <laughs> and I would ask her, so what do you think women should do do you realize that these women are actually battered women? It took me a while to grasp this problem. And once I started inquiring in this, in this issue, I learned that the problem of females, female only arrest and dual arrests for domestic violence range between 10% and 40% of arrests in different communities in the US. So it's a huge arrest rate. According to the general social survey here in Canada, uh, of about maybe close to 15,000 people, 8% of women 
and out of about 12,000 of men, 7% of men reported at least one incident of physical violence by a current or ex-partner during a, a five-year period. The statistics did me no good. I was convinced that a single or a few incidents of isolated incidents of violence didn't tell the whole story at all. Actually, it lucky did, made it more muddy. We needed to pay attention to battery, which is a systematic and pattern of coercive control, which may or may not be established by physical or sexual abuse every time. It could be established by isolating the victim, denying her reality, minimizing and blaming her for the violence, verbal abuse, turning the children and family against her. You know, all of the, um, I'm sure all of you know, the power and control wheel, all of the spokes of the power and control wheel. The only thing that is missing there in many of the immigrant communities, it's also the threats of deportation. But of course, the threats of physical and sexual violence is ever present in all of these cases. Um, the interesting part was when in women's use of violence, the, the argument of self-defense, the claim of self-defense did not work well either because many of the time women used violence when there was no imminent, imminent danger. So they could be just hitting out at a particular period. What, what was going on. So uh, the law enforcement that we worked with were not at all convinced what was going on. However, when I talked to South Asian advocates, African American women, native women, in, or the women of the First Nation in our, in our country, uh, USA, they got my point immediately. They understood. And we often laughed together at what in heaven's name was going on with Ellen's organization or the quirks of the dominant community. And then I began the research. And I began to um, conduct in-depth interviews with women who had been court ordered to BIPs and who had self-referred to these programs. My perception and understanding actually began to change at that point. And I also recognized how diff what a difficult bind women's advocates were in. Um, even though I have been in the movement for a long time, but still I saw what was the problem with particularly the dominant community advocates. In the early days, if you, if you, you know, kind of, some of you will go back with me on this. In the early days when the anti-violence against women advocates and activists gathered their forces to ensure battered women's safety and hold batterers accountable for their behavior, they had to overcome tremendous resistance in the community, in the systems, in the government, particularly the law enforcement. They had to accomplish, and this was a time when law enforcement just take the batterers and the men out and take them around the block and come back and say, don't do this again. So the advocates had to accomplish a very difficult job of bringing the discourse of battering from the private sphere to the public domain, believing that this would help in including it in the purview of the law, the legal system, so to speak. So after the first phase of success, the later decades were set on firming up legal recourses, extending the resource list for victims. Now, regardless of the great success or whatever medium success the uh, movement, violence against women movement has experienced, it has never had a breathing space. It has had to prove its necessity over and over again to politicians, to funders, to researchers, and to community members. It has had to make the case that such violence has a gendered nature over and over again. So when this is taken out of you know, violence, the women use, when it's taken out of context, it can, be, it can really create havoc. 
Two Canadian scholars, Marley Dragowitz and Walter de Cassaretti, write these results, that is they're talking about the 7% men reporting at least one incident of spousal violence in a five year period. So these results were seized upon by some journalists and anti-feminist groups to support claims about an invisible epidemic of husband battering. So what we are talking about here is that there, was, there were people, the detractors and people in the systems who were ready to s dismiss all of the claims of violence against women. So advocates were really pushed to a corner not to talk about anything that muddied up the scene. They were going to hide this. Yet what was happening was battered women were asking for intervention. When women used violence or any force against their heterosexual partners, they felt deeply guilty and they would call, they were the first ones to call the emergency number for emergency assistance and then when the first responders arrived at their doors, they were the first ones to confess uh, that yes, I've done this, that I've scratched or I've hit or I've picked up a knife against my intimate partner. And when they were char charged with crime of committing spousal abuse, they pled guilty without delay, without even an attorney being present, so that they could go back to their children and their home. But by then, nothing was the same. Once they had admitted, they were ordered to BIPs in the best of situations and suffer worse cons consequences if the conditions were turned differently. The abusers learned very, very quickly that mandatory arrest, preferred arrest, and no drop prosecution, all of these were created to make sure that the batteries were not allowed to use violence with impunity, but these were turned against the women. Uh, and the, the Abusers, quite frankly, learned very quickly that these could be used to their advantage. Battered, and once that happened, battered women were pushed to even tighter corners. Many more batterers call the police when the intimate partner is attempting to resist control, not to give in to the demands of unquestioned obedience, or threatened to report the, the uh, partner's abuse. So, uh, in fact, the research now shows that men are more likely to call faster than women, call for assistance. <coughs> Let me give you um, a, 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 another scenario very quickly. This is Rahima's story. He has always hurt me. He slapped me every time he ordered me to get a glass of water and I didn't get it in an instant. It increased after I came to this country, that's the US. I loved the plane ride coming to the US because I went for 24 hours without being hit. This day, I was on the floor and he was dragging me to the door by my hair. You will not live under my roof another single minute, he said. Where would I go? How could I leave my children? I didn't have any money. I don't even speak English. I was struggling to free my hair and stay in. He let me go and I ran into the bedroom and locked the door. He called the police and they arrested me. He had shown them the scra some scratches on his arms from my fingernails. It must have happened when I was trying to free myself. Now I'm here. And this was, she came to um, a, a support group, an audit to a support group, because, because she didn't speak English actually, she came, and it was kind of good for her because then she came to Manali, otherwise she would have gone somewhere else. Now, even though Rahima has been, uh, was subjected to unthinkable violence for years and years, she was, and she was in the US for over six years at that point, she had never considered calling the police. Okay? And this, by the way, has become a big issue in, in, in the uh, subject matter that I'm discussing. Um, 
law enforcement and legal institutions have argued that instead of using force to end abuse, battered women should call the police to stop their abusers. So it's on them to call the police so that the first responders can go. The police are there to help, they say, and despite the presence of, the, uh, of such a strong community resource, when women use violence against their intimate partners, it cannot be accepted as legal use of force, all right? So now comes the question, why don't women call? What goes on that they don't call? Well, let me just give you an example from my community because that's the one I know best. But um, this is not so different in other uh, marginalized communities either. Uh, in, in, this, in a South Asia, the whole South Asia was under colonial British rule for about 200 years, or a little more probably. The law enforcement and the legal system uh, during that time was the repressive arm of the administration. Its relationship to the people was arbitrary and adversarial at best, and generally one of oppression and torture most of the time. And for women, this was even worse because the relationship was even worse because not only they were tortured and abused, but they were tortured and abused because the, the police, the uh, law enforcement wanted to extract information from them about uh, others. And the abuse was obviously extremely gendered. So that was, um, that was important. And after independence, um, almost all South Asian countries decided to keep the police force intact and not disband them, even though it was modified, but it was the same people who uh, stayed in the police force. So the mistrust that was generated during the colonial times and remained in the collective memory did not have a chance to uh, dissipate or it wasn't ameliorated. And that um, mistrust was reinforced by the law enforcement's extremely oppressive role on a day-to-day -day life in the communities, on, uh, during um, insurgencies that had happened in, there, in, in the countries. So, and in, on top of such brutalities the, uh, in a collective fashion, what ends up happening in South Asia and, and in many of the South Asian countries, that, cus that custodial rape has become a very big issue. So when women are brought into custody, for some reason taken into custody, um, almost, you know, people know, well, you know, that's going to be, uh, she's going to be raped. So rape has become another, um, you know, very gendered, but a, a, another way of subjugating um, the people. So in, in, in a once, that's from the, uh, that's from the home countries, and they, this, they bring this to the new nation that they are entering. But in here, in the US and perhaps in Canada, and you, you're the best judges of that, the experiences of women and the communities with the law enforcement is generally harsh, negative, and racist. And the encounters with the police have become quite difficult. And something as simple as a traffic stop and what happens at the traffic stop is not separated out from what will happen if I call the police, but generally goes into the collective memory, collective response to police. On top of that, batterers usually fuel the, fuel the fear of immigrant female victims by intimidating them with the certainty of being raped if they dare to complain to the police. They will be taken into uh, the precincts and this might happen. So you can imagine that calling the police is not on the top priority list of marginalized communities. And by the way, this is also true for the African-American communities, as you know, if you've been following what is happening in um, the US now, you know the number of um, young men and boys being killed arbitrarily by the police. 
um, and of course, indigenous communities, uh, First Nations, that there is an extreme um, negative relationship and difficult relationship with the law enforcement. On top of that, if you think about it, at least for South Asian women and for many uh, women in many other communities, keeping the marriage intact is an enormous pressure. Calling the police and getting a restraining order or some kind of an order against an intimate partner might provide them with some degree of um, protection, but simultaneously it rings the end of the marriage. The majority of women want to end abuse they don't want necessarily to end the marriage, at least in, in um, uh, marginalized communities and with communities of color. So the socialization patterns uh, that are forced on women to maintain the marriage also restrain them from seeking law enforcement help and also leave them with no other alternatives but to use force to escape abuse or to end abuse. So it's, a, it's a really a catch-22 at this point. Women of color in the United States, at least, have been very critical of the mainstream uh, movement's um, over-reliance on law enforcement and the judiciary to keep women safe from partner abuse. Many activists of color, particularly if you know of Insight, um, it's an organization, uh, it, it's called Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, and it uh, represents radical feminists of color, has pointed out the absurdity of relying, relying on criminal legal interventions when both law enforcement and the legal system perpetrate significant violence against communities of color. Ananya Bhattacharji, who is a co-founder of Sakhi, another South Asian organization in New York, also claims the boundaries between protector and perpetrator are blurred when it comes to lived realities of the poor, immigrant, and women of color, and perhaps all women. So how logical is it to expect women in minority and marginalized communities to seek help from law enforcement and um, legal institutions when they are being battered. Well, it is not just women of color or women of other minority communities who are vulnerable to using force against intimate partners. Women with disabilities who are living with intimate partners may also fall into this category. Use of force or violence may be the only way that women with disabilities can protect themselves, not just from the partner's violence, but also deliberate dependence instigated by the partner, such as um, medicine being kept away from them, so she has to ask for it every time, such as um, the, the living places are um, made you know, not easy for the wheelchair to be moving around, but to uh, cover it in a way that she has to ask for his help to move around the house, uh, and so on and so forth. And there's a wonderful article that I would recommend all of you read about this. Michelle Ballon and Molly Burke Fryer has written a wonderful article on self-defense of women with disabilities. Uh, and uh, it came out in Violence Against Women, the journal, in September 2012. And the whole issue, by the way, is on uh, women's use of force. So what do we know at this point about uh, women's use of violence against intimate partners? We know that we have to understand women's use of violence in intimate heterosexual relationships in the context of battering not single incidents, but a context of patterned abuse. That not all violence is battering, that battered women who use force or violence are not batterers. They are not using systematic and patterned violence. They're trying to end or escape abuse. 
On the other hand, intimate partners often engage in common couple violence. Uh, Michael Johnson has talked about that, common couples violence, which is there's no particular um, differential, difference of power between the couple, or there may not be any fear factor involved there, but they just, you know, that's a, one of the ways they can do it. It's not the perfect way, but that's the, one of the way they uh, engage. So um, com there's a difference between common couple violence, couples violence, and domestic terrorism. And the domestic terrorism is what we are calling battery. That we often confront advocates and law enforcement and the legal system often conflate battering and common couples violence. The, the way we can isolate the two is by assessing for coercive control. That's critical in this work, that assess for coercive control, who has control. And the way you can do it by assessing for the predominant aggressor. So I know that here I think um, it is used as primary aggressor. I have a little bit of difficulty with the, uh, with the term primary because often, although I think we are talking about the same thing, who's a predominant aggressor, um, but the primary, the word primary a lot of time means who started it. And because of the incident focus of, um, of the legal systems, they tend to say, who started it first? And that's, that's, that's a bit problematic when you use the word primary. Uh, so it's not that you have to change it all over, but to at least think about it, at least be mindful about that. Women who believe or who in actuality cannot access resources are more likely to use violence to escape abuse to keep that in mind. Women of color, women of the First Nation, immigrant women, women without status, these are the people who see law enforcement as, or other resources in the community as not accessible to them. Whether it is perception or actuality, that is what it is. And these are the people who are going to, these are the women who are going to use violence because there is no other resources available to them. They are the ones who, can, who will decide, I need to escape and how will I do it? So the battered women's violence against their intimate partners needs to be categorized in a slightly different way. Perhaps we can categorize it as resistive violence that we are trying to resist that women are trying to resist the violence that they are experiencing. May I have the slide, please? I just took out this one slide. I thought you might enjoy that. <laughs> Damned if you do and dead if you don't. All right. So if we want to lower the violence used by battered women, not only we have to, we as advocates have to be more effective in holding batterers accountable, but we need to develop more solid resources and support systems for battered women in marginalized communities. That I think is critical in the work that we do. We also, and this is for the researchers perhaps in the room, need to develop a really valid tool to assess battered women's use of force. Right now, the, the most common tool is CTS and CTS2, really, um, conflict tactics scale. Both of them, I mean, the, the scale, CTS, does not really, is not sensitive to cultural differences, and it, again, is very, very incident focused. So you have to be really uh, thinking about that. And perhaps out of your work will come out a much better tool that looks at women's violence, battered women's violence. So there are so many issues here. It's not, it's not even touching any of you know, the, really the core of um, this work. It's a very complex problem. But what I would like to do and uh, because, you know, and, I, and by the way, I think Eva is in a, a perfect position 
to, um, to really influence the policies and practices in this area. Because it, it is with institutional changes and advocacy changes that we can really address this issue to a certain degree. I started off telling you about Ellen and how she pushed me to do this work. And I want to end with a quote from Ellen. Uh, she writes, she wrote, I do not want to assert that women are not capable of being violent and therefore should always be left alone. Women are proficient in using abusive and oppressive aggression. We only have to take a look at our country's history of slavery to know how women have participated in and benefited from the violence of purchasing and maintaining slaves. But because of the cultures and structures of our society, very few women seem capable of inflicting violence against their intimate opposite sex partners. My problem is not that women are grouped with others who use violence, but that the wrong women are enrolled in batterers intervention programs. My skepticism becomes comprehensible if we consider how society would change with the end of men's and women's violence against their intimate partners. For instance, even if we could halt all violence by women, I do not believe we would get rid of the scourge of domestic violence from our communities. In fact, we may actually see an increase in men's aggression as much of women's violence works to contain their partner's hostilities. In contrast, if we could stop all male violence against women, then we could truly hope to see a society more or less free of domestic violence. Thus, the efforts to pursue and prosecute battered women for domestic violence carry little significance in the ultimate struggle to end domestic violence. And I thank you all for your patience in listening to me. We seem to have a thank you. Uh, we seem to have a little time, so maybe we can have some questions or thoughts. How many of you have faced this issue? Uh, right. okay. So what, any questions, any thoughts? Perhaps you can share some of your experiences. Yes. Profoundly, what I take away from that quote is the wrong women are being incarcerated. Women with disabilities are being criminalized at an alarming rate in this country and across the world. And of course, everyone here knows about Ashley Smith. It's a prominent example, but I just wanted to, to underline and underpin how important a, a point that was and to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Shamita. I'm over here. Um, thank you so much, and I so appreciate having yeah. you here. Um, I've been doing work in the uh, area of vi women's use of violence for since since the 90s as well, and have um, really enjoy, enjoyed your talk, and really enjoy having you here, and hope that we have some chance today to have a little bit more of a conversation. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the struggles that um, I have had over the years that I've been doing this work is that is the whole issue of being able to um, around primary aggressor. And I appreciate your um, your comments around that because I think that it it holds us back uh, so much, and particularly when um, with police when they they're so focused on 
the incident, and they're only looking at that one incident, and supposedly trying to sort out um, using a primary, primary aggressor um, uh, policy that we have in this province, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work on the ground. And how do we shift that? Do you have any thoughts on, on that? <laughs> it's probably a big issue, I'm sure. <laughs> You're probably doing the best uh, work much better than me, I can tell you. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, and I don't know how, how well it can be done in a very large community, but one of the things that can be done is put in filters and a lot of training in the policy and practice of the law enforcement, put in filters. So when the first responders get there, they immediately try to at least, however, they can try to uh, assess who's the predominant aggressor. Um, and if they cannot, okay, so they arrest both or whatever, they take them. At that point, the advocates need to come in to work with the prosecutor to get another filter to say, okay, so now you know, we've looked at it, we've listened to you know, the story of the pattern of abuse that has come, you know, gone on. So now we cut her loose again. So you know, if we can put filters in different, at different levels, that might be um, helpful. You know, but, but on the other hand, I also think we have to really work hard to get the um, word out in the, in, uh, to women. That there are, there, you know, let's not go there. Let's, let's stop before we have to use um, violence. So different kinds of resources, availability of resources. And the second is absolutely trying to, you know, what we have all, all of us are doing, stopping the violence in the first place, the battering in the first place, the male battering, so that she doesn't have to take that route. I'm not sure I answer your question, but you know, I don't think there is a one clear. Uh, no, there isn't. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, that was very thank good. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, I just want to re reiterate um, and remind people that for, I don't know, at least over 10 years, we've had this primary aggressor assessment that is required by, within the RCMP, Violence and Relationships Policy, and we've been working in this amazing partnership with the RCMP, um, doing research on this phenomenon of women who are victims being arrested, and we have access to the Prime database, and we're working with uh, Margaret Jackson and Chris Giles at SFU through Frida and the Criminology Department. And so there's, there's gonna, they're gonna be doing a workshop this afternoon, tomorrow. To, tomorrow afternoon, about the results of that research. But I just, in the meantime, and I take your point about the language and how powerful the language that we use of whether or not we're looking at, I mean, basically our primary aggressor policy is, is looking at the history of violence in the relationship. So while it's called primary aggressor, I guess there is the, you know, the danger of them looking at who started it because that anecdotally is what we've been hearing from advocates across the province that sometimes women are arrested because he said she started it, which, so, and so what yeah. we, we've actually found, like the evidence that we found, is that it's often the case that the primary aggressor assessment hasn't been used. And I think that, um, you know, we have, like many different sectors, the, the RCMP and police and nurses and so forth, there's been a huge retirement, like the demographic of retirement. So a lot of new officers. And, and there's about 6,000 policies that they have to learn when they become a police officer. And so I'm not sure to what extent we are you know, making sure that they all know that a primary aggressor assessment is something that needs to be done. But my you know, idea is that many of you are part of violence against women coordination committees in your community, or you're part of uh, interagency case assessment teams. And maybe what we could start doing immediately is having a conversation with your detachments is to ask them what their own policy is in terms of primary aggressor assessments because they have the policy to back them up to do it um, and they certainly have the support from E-Division headquarters but I think that there's something that's getting lost in the middle and that it's not always done. And mm -hmm. so, it, so, so I think we have the policy tool if only if it was, if it was used. So, just an idea to take it back to your communities um, when you're having discussions about practice to ask uh, police, municipal and RCMP, is you know 
are they using the primary aggressor assessment? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's ab absolutely, but I think it's also critical to ask, what do they understand by primary? Yeah, it's really, really critical because um, what we found that it's who started it. And, you know, that's, you're talking about people who are in the trenches, who are going out as first responders. They're really edged at that point, they know they're jazzed up. So what does that mean? Thank you. I, I just wanted to build on that point. Thank you very much for your remarks. Thank I just you. wanted to say, talk about the domino effect um, sometimes called the knockback effect, which is not a good term here, but in terms of policing, it's also a reflection of what goes on higher up the chain in terms of the justice system and the way our criminal code in Canada is structured, apart from the offense of stalking, the way the offenses are laid out, they're very much structured according to individual incidents. Yeah. So even though our primary aggressor policy is a very good policy and, and police may work hard, the reality is that unless we begin to do more work with Crown prosecutors in terms of what kind of evidence they're prepared to bring forward in terms of a history of abuse, some of which may not have been reported to police, there are avenues for Crown to do that. But in our province, the way Crown are organized, there's a high degree of individual discretion in terms of how Crown practice. So there's a huge range in terms of the openness of Crown to bring those kind of historic arguments. So we know from the research that women may have been abused about 30 times before they report. So do you have a Crown that's prepared to bring some of that history forward? And then if you're a police officer, knowing that, how is that going to affect your practice? So I just really want to reinforce if you're uh, if you do have a Crown Prosecutor that you liaise with or who is part of your Violence Against Women Coordination Committee to begin to work with them to open that dialogue. It has to be sensitively handled because Crown isn't a freewheeling agent. They work within the law, but yeah, um, yeah that's really important. So thank you. I just wanted to put that, that important step in. And I don't know what your experience has been in the States in terms of working with Crown. Um, it is, you know, one of the things that we, um, what you're saying is exactly that. Because the law is prior bad yeah, acts don't yeah, count, right? Yeah. You cannot bring in prior bad acts. So right there we run into trouble. So there has to be that kind of a shift to say, yeah, we have to look at the pattern of abuse. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it just doesn't make sense. But the other piece that I would like to encourage you to do is to work with defense attorneys also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's a cha there's a tremendous tendency of defense attorneys to go for a plea, plea bargain quickly. You know, say, okay, so you, yeah, you did it. Maybe we can work out to have uh, just probation for you or uh, something, you know, something um, not that significant. Yeah, yeah. Or they think it's not that significant um, if you just, confess, or if you just say, yeah, I did it, a plea. However, it has tremendous effect on women's ability to get custody later, uh, immigration, and various other ways, um, particular types of jobs. Uh, so we have to really be working with defense attorneys also to say, don't go for a plea agreement quickly. Because there's, you know, at least for public defenders in the U.S., there's a tendency to say, let's not waste court's money. Mm -hmm. You know, plea, mm -hmm. get it over with. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you. Shamita, I want to thank you again for your years of work, and I also was working in the 90s and, and using your materials and, and uh, have really learned so much from you. I don't want to take too much space because really what I want to do is reiterate the piece that um, really hit me and is, and that I'm holding on to is the, the language of uh, the difference between primary and predominant. And I think that um, your last statement about asking um, the officers what they understand primary to mean is really important. I'm going to take that away with me. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. I just had, wondered if you had any comments on uh, the pattern of coercive control and arrest uh, in custody and access disputes because um, I know of uh, an incident <clears throat> where um, uh, the pattern of his control was to get her arrested for withholding the children if she varied the 
custody and for weather purposes or things like that. Do you have any incidents of that kind of thing that goes on after the relationship's over? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, all of that, what you've said is absolutely correct. Because, um, <coughs> and, and the lived realities of women, once she is uh, put on probation or once she's sent to BIP, he has actually uh, a tremendous um, leverage on her at that point. In term, not only just in terms of custody, but also to, to say, I will report you again. I will report to your probation officer, I will report uh, to you to your BIP, whatever that might be. So she, he actually, at that point, has more power over her and, 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 and in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for that. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned very, you know, different populations that don't want to call the police or don't want to interact either because of historic experiences, current experiences with the police, or even um, experience with the prison system. Um, and I'm just curious if you could speak at all a bit more about maybe some strategies that um, your organization has used to work with um, populations who don't want to report to the police and who don't see that as a feasible way for them to stop the violence and how we can support people in, in those communities. You know, this is a really critical question and I wish I had a great answer for you. I really don't. Particularly in the US, um, what the movement has done, and also by the, uh, um, from the administration, they've put, there's a tremendous overemphasis on law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? So everything law enforcement, all you have to do is to call 911 and everything's going to be solved. And yet we know as immigrants, and particularly after 9-11 happened, in fact, when women did call 911, right next day there will be a raid in the uh, community. Yeah. So now, not only is she herself really um, worried from her partner's abuse, uh, but now the community is angry with her. Yeah, you, call, you ended up calling 911 and bringing the police to us? What in heaven's name is going on? For, um, for a while, you know, if you, if you pick up any, um, or call the hotline of any organization in, um, in the US, they'll say, in a case of emergency, please call 911. Uh, and we stopped that mm -hmm. and for a long time. Because n calling 911 actually meant more problem, not only for her, but her at that point, remember, that um, in certain communities, Muslims, and particular uh, from Bangladesh and other places, um, they were supposed to, anybody over 14 was, was supposed to register. Yeah. And that by itself is you know, really frightening. You never know. There were people who were deported without um, the family knowing what happened. So we just said, OK, no more. I mean, we'll have to figure this out uh, in a different way. We can't have this, please call 911 on the phone anymore. Um, we have gone back to it, and we are trying to work with the uh, law enforcement as to how to do it. But it's still very iffy. Yeah. I do not have a good strategy. What we try to do is to raise awareness to say, okay, we are here. Before you, you know, let's figure out alternatives before you get to the point of hitting out. Yeah. You know, let's see you know, if we can catch you early. Um, and I wish I could have a better story for you. Well, thank you for bringing it up. Thank you for highlighting it thank for you. us. Thank you very, I'm sorry. Oh, no more? Just, okay, no more. I can, so one more or no? no? Okay, I'm sorry. We can, I can talk to you later on. I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much.